My name is Megan Haydit, and I work at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And I would like to first thank you all for coming out today to provide comment. We are very interested in what you have to say. We, we want to know your top priorities in food and agricultural research, education, and extension. And what are the most promising opportunities for advancement of food and agricultural sciences? So we have an agenda. I hope all of you picked up a copy outside. And I'll let you know that that is our guide for the day. Today is really about hearing from you. So we've given each speaker five to 10 minutes to talk. And if we run a little ahead, that's OK. We'll just move up speakers. This is our guide. Um, this is our fourth listening session. Some people may not show up, so we'll skip ahead. We also have flexibility at the end of our program for folks that are not on the schedule that would like to provide comment. So we have a great group of participants today, um, a really diverse group. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone respects the speaker that's up here. Um, so please silence your phones, and if you're having side conversations, please take them out of the room. We will have a morning break. As you've seen, we have some refreshments outside. Please help yourself. The bathrooms are around the corner, back out towards the lobby. When you're speaking, please stay at the podium. This session is being webcast, so folks can view this online, and we want to make sure that they see the speaker. Also, if there's a little bit of extra time after your presentation, we will accept um, questions. So if you have a question for the speaker, please come up to this mic to the right of the stage and introduce yourself. Um, additionally, we'd like to take a photo of the entire group at our morning break. So please don't disappear too quickly. Um, and I think that is about it for our morning. So I would like to start with a video welcome from the NIFA director, Dr. Sunny Ramaswamy. Hello, uh, my name is Sunny Ramaswamy. I'm the director of the National Institute of uh, Food and Agriculture. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to what we refer to as NIFA Listens. This is an opportunity for you to be personally involved in telling us where we need to be investing our resources in regards to the research, extension, and teaching endeavors that uh, NIFA supports and the work that you undertake at uh, your institutions. We. Uh, are offering this opportunity uh, for in-person uh, uh, input and uh, if it turns out that you've got additional thoughts that you want to share with us you could certainly go to our website uh, nifa.usda.gov slash nifa listens again nifa.usda.gov slash nifa listens and you have the opportunity to provide additional input through the first of December of 2017. I can guarantee you that all this input that's going to be provided by you in person or through the uh, our website. I'd encourage you to also talk to your colleagues that have not participated here to tell them to also provide input. We're going to take all of this input and analyze the, the information that's been provided to us and incorporate that into the priorities that are going to be investing in over the next many, many years. I want to thank you uh, for participating this, in this very important effort and uh, uh, look forward to engaging with you now and in future as well. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. My name is Mukarab Qureshi, and I'm the deputy director of one of the program institutes of National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce the next uh, person who's going to uh, welcome you all, Dr. Mayor Broussard. Dr. Broussard is the deputy director, is the, excuse me, associate director of programs of National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Dr. Broussard uh, 
has extremely impressive credentials as uh, a scientist, as uh, an administrator, as a leader. In his capacity uh, as a scientist, he's an aquaculture geneticist, uh, nationally and internationally known for his contributions towards aquaculture genetics. Uh, the, as the folklore goes, uh, he joined uh, USDA during the time of Abraham Lincoln. Um, just kidding, Dr. Broussard. Um, uh, he's a pioneer with USDA. He joined uh, uh, early, early agencies of what then became CSRE, so Cooperative State Research Extension Education Service, and then uh, eventually transformed into what we now have, National Institute of Food and Agriculture. In fact, uh, the reorganization of CSREES into NIFA based on uh, 2008 farm bills really was, uh, was predominantly his doing how we look as a NIFA entity today. Um, my memory with him is that he started as the director for the animal systems, uh, and then the, uh, the administrator for plant and animal systems when we combined uh, them together. And then eventually when NIFA uh, was established, uh, he moved up to be the, uh, the associate director of NIFA, which oversees all four program institutes. It's my real pleasure to invite Dr. Broussard to speak to us and give us some opening remarks as well. Um, this external NIFA listen session is really his idea, his baby. So it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Broussard to welcome you. Such kind remarks from Dr. Qureshi. I remember I hired him and I uh, uh, really appreciate that. And uh, you know, things were a lot simpler during the Lincoln administration, I'll have to admit. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to all the sessions, so this is our fourth session. I've been listening online, and we are committed to listening what you do. This is, this is so important to us in terms of ensuring the relevancy of our program. We have some of our university partners participating, key stakeholders, the end users, uh, lots of partners. It's been very exciting to listen to what you think is important. And these regional listening sessions have been really important in terms of a regional flavor and what's important in particular regions. So I want to thank our team for pulling this together. We've had a great team and we really appreciate it in terms of logistics. Uh, we have plenty of opportunity to continue to listen to you in terms of the formal input all the way up to through December. So those who are not here online listening, we still want your input. But really appreciate you being here, taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, Everything we do at NIFA is through a partnership. Uh, we have a $1.5 billion portfolio that we have oversight for, but we have about 350 people that work for the agency, a relatively small agency that's got to get the money out, got to design programs. And again, this sort of activity r really helps us in terms of ensuring the relevancy of the program. We have briefed the secretary staff about this. Last week we were in, in the, Sonny and I were in the deputy secretary office last Friday at the agency had meetings. We've talked about NIFA listens as something we really think is important and the, they really appreciate what we're doing and what you're doing in participating in this. So I just want to thank you for being here. This is important. Dr. Kreshi is going to have some uh, uh, follow up on what we're doing and how we'll use this information. But this, again, I guarantee you, our staff and a lot of our senior staff is here. We have a lot of people listening online. We are going to pay attention to the comments you provide, all the comments. And we actually have an internal listening session. Part of that charge is listening to our national program staff and what they've heard from stakeholders So uh, through these sessions. So really appreciate you being here. Thanks a million. I'm going to be here all day and uh, look forward to it. This is the first one I've participated in live. I've looked at every, all of them online. I've actually gone back to look at the replay of a lot of them because it's pretty exciting. Friday I was sitting there, my, or last week I was sitting in my office when we did the Sacramento listening session. I kind of said, well, I'll put it on, but I've got some other things I'll be doing while I'm listening. But I couldn't do that. I had to stop the other stuff and just listen and uh, really appreciated the uh, what we're learning from these sessions. Thanks a million. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dr. Bruce Arden. Before we go further, uh, uh, let me uh, 
ask all our NIFA colleagues to please stand up so that people in the audience know uh, who you are and uh, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to interact and uh, socialize uh, during the break time. With Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, as I said earlier, NIFA really is, um, is an extramural agency of our mission area, which is called REE, Research, Education, and Economics Mission Area. Um, we collaborate with people like you in the audience, people in land-grant university systems, uh, uh, a very diverse uh, uh, stakeholder uh, partners, and, and conduct activities which are research, education, and extension through these partnerships. Uh, we believe that uh, scientific progress is only possible through discoveries and innovation which we make through research, we educate our next generation of scientists and workforce, as well as take all those discoveries to the end user through our extension and outreach programs. Uh, NIFA prioritizes its portfolios based on several guidances which we receive. The most important guidance or our marching orders, so to speak, come from the Congress of the United States of America. Uh, you're all familiar with the Farm Bill, which is essentially the footprint based on which our programmatic uh, operations happen, uh, along with um, things which are um, funded through what we call the appropriation process. Quite frequently, we also receive uh, certain priorities from um, Office of the President through executive orders or Office of Science and Technology Policy or um, uh, directly from the White House. Uh, we have started this, uh, this process of listening to stakeholders by first uh, talking to our internal program staff, which is our national program leaders. Um, yes, we are a federal agency, but I take pride in saying that our federal agency is really science-based. All our national program leaders, program specialists, are subject matter experts in their own right. They have served in academia, they have served in various science-based agencies and enterprises, businesses, operations, federal agencies, and bring a very unique skill set to what they think through their professional society meetings, through their program staff meetings, through their travels across the country, through their state liaison functions, what they think are important priorities which NIFA ought to be addressing through uh, as Dr. Broussard said, $1.5 billion portfolio of research extension and, and education. But also, uh, in addition to the internal uh, listening session through what we call NEFA Science Week, which we had last year, um, or early this year, I guess, uh, we are now reaching out to external stakeholders. As Dr. Broussard said, this is our fourth external listening session. First one was in Kansas City, second one in Atlanta, third one was um, in um, Sacramento. I was there, I forgot, right? And now the fourth one here. Um, we are really getting some great ideas and great input, and as Dr. Bruce said, really some regional flavors, and that was the idea that we go around the country and listen to our stakeholders what they think is important for them. Uh, after all is said and done, um, we are essentially asking two very broad questions. And these are broad for a purpose, so that we are here to listen to everything what you think is important for you. We are not passing any judgment. We are not asking you any questions why you're saying that. We are simply here to listen to what you think are the top priorities. And secondly, what you think are the possible opportunities for us to, to advance science through our stakeholder and partnership. Uh, we would uh, take all these priorities and feedback and synthesize this input and hopefully do several things. Primarily, 
your input would inform our budget process. That's really the bottom line, that when we write our budget proposal to the, to the Congress, we want to make sure that that budget proposal addresses the priorities which you're going to guide us today and, uh, and what the, the feedback which we have received so far. And combined with your feedback and feedback from our program staff, we hope to craft uh, our futuristic budget priorities which are truly mission critical, which are important to you, to our stakeholder, and that we support all those efforts through our funding. Uh, stakeholder uh, input is in person, but in addition to in person, our electronic line would be open till December 1st. I encourage you all to go back and continue to input your ideas in this, uh, in this portal, because we will take all of these ideas, whether we are gathering through internal listening sessions or in person listening sessions or electronic mode, we will take all these ideas and synthesize them into our priorities. So with that, I thank you and we look forward to a, a, a wonderful uh, day, a wonderful session. But I must say this, that we could not have done this without one person who's Megan Hayden. So I'll hand over this program to Megan to take it from here. Well, a couple more reminders. Um, if you have a PowerPoint presentation that ha you have not sent ahead of time, you can meet with Kevin over there in the corner and he will upload it and get it all set to be broadcast during your speaking time. I do have some reminders when you have five minutes and two minutes left. Um, we have a slide advancer. All of these things that you need should be up here and ready to go. So without further ado, I think we will go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is Christy Balch from Crossroads Community Food Network. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a former 4-H kid from Wisconsin. I grew up on a farm, so I've had a long history with NIFA USDA. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm the, now the executive director of the Crossroads Community Food Network. We're a really small nonprofit based here in Maryland, and we are building a healthier, more inclusive food system in the Tacoma Langley Crossroads, which is a primarily immigrant, low-income community just outside of Washington, D.C. So at this heart of this um, very integrated network of food growers, food makers, and food consumers that we work with is our Crossroads Farmers Market. That's where I'm headed right after this today. Um, we have a Wednesday Farmers Market. And that was where the um, origination of Double Dollars programs came from. So it matches, if families are spending federal nutrition benefits, we match those dollars with privately raised dollars and that enables low-income families to bring home more healthy food at the same time it supports local farmers and three-quarters of our vendors at our farmers market are immigrants themselves so it's a really interesting farmers market and we also have a program that we help food entrepreneurs grow and build a legal food business we work with a lot of informal food entrepreneurs and work to make them formalized and then we also recently just opened the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Community Kitchen which is a shared use kitchen allowing low-income food entrepreneurs to get a start in the business without having to spend a lot of money on their own brick and mortar so we were founded in 2007 as this innovative farmers market that did this double dollars program and one of our founders many of you probably know Gus Schumacher who passed away earlier this year so over the last 10 seasons that we've been in operation, we've distributed over $450,000 in our incentive dollars to more than 14,000 individuals, families, and seniors who are low-income folks. And so we are now a NIFA grantee in two 
of the NIFA programs, the Com Community Food Project Competitive Grant Program. That funds our community kitchen and supporting food entrepreneur class. And then also we are now a Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program grantee, also known as FINI. And that is helping us really take our mission to a new level, which is really allowing us to do more outreach to SNAP customers in our area. So these two grants, while I'm sure they're considered small programs at NIFA, are having a huge impact in our community and other low-income communities across the country. So I can't emphasize enough how big of a difference those programs are making. And we were well poised to take on our Finney project because we were a participant in a larger AFRI grant that went to University of Wisconsin and the National Farmers Market Coalition. Um, it was called Farmers Market Metrics, and it taught us and other markets across the country how to collect really rigorous data that investigated the impacts that farmers markets have on their communities. So um, just to sum up, I just wanted to give some broader impacts on these grant programs. The Farmers Market Coalition released a report about the Finney program, and just in the first year of the Finney program, which where there were 13 grantees, that reached over 1,000 farmers markets in 27 states, those markets distributed $3 million in incentives and $5 million in SNAP, and that resulted in approximately 16 to 32 million additional servings of fruits and vegetables for SNAP households. And this also, importantly, translated to $14.3 million in economic activity for rural economies. So that was just the start. This program continues to grow, and I see firsthand every day these impacts. And then the Community Food Projects grant is really interesting. The, the way that it's evaluated is um, through this Indicators of Success project, and it shows the very diverse impacts of this grant. So it could be increases in fruits and vegetable consumption, building capacity within communities, job creation, training new farmers, all sorts of impacts. And what's really important to me is that these projects often take a very holistic view of the food system and are solving these systemic issues on a community level. So um, in conclusion, NIFA's work in community food systems is critically important and taking this systems view is essential. Crossroads Community Food Network is grateful for the Finney and CFP grant programs and the, the work that they allow us to do in this community. Thank you for your time. Actually, Christy, we have a couple more minutes. If you would like to come back up here and take any questions, are there any comments or questions from the audience? If so, I invite you to come up to this mic. Okay, thank you. So as you can see, we might be running ahead of schedule. That's how it goes. We didn't know if there would be 60 people or 160 people that wanted to come talk today. So I appreciate everyone remaining flexible with our agenda. Next up, we have Richard Sellers from the American Feed Industry Association. Good morning. A couple of personal comments. It's good to see Dr. Broussard. We grew up two blocks from each other in Memphis, Tennessee. It's kind of amazing. Right behind Graceland, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm a lobbyist. Uh, I've spent 26 years in the lobbying area for the American Feed Industry Association, and we are extremely staunch advocates for agriculture research funding. We have a foundation that funds some agriculture research that's also NIFA funded at Virginia Tech. And, I, and we've got some specific things for our network of nutritionists, of which I'm a board certified animal nutritionist, that we want to share in this public comment period. So my name is Richard Sellers, and I'm Senior Vice President for Public Policy and Education of the American Feed Industry Association based in Arlington, Virginia. AFI is the world's largest organization devoted exclusively to representing the business, legislative, and regulatory interests of the U.S. animal food industry and its suppliers. AFI members include more than 670 domestic and international companies such as livestock feed and pet food manufacturers, integrators, pharmaceutical companies, ingredient suppliers, equipment manufacturers, and supply companies 
that provide other pro products or services to feed manufacturers. The feed industry plays a critical role in the production of healthy, wholesome meat, milk, fish, and eggs, and supports policies that uphold U.S. food and feed safety, ensure the proper nutrition of animals, and protect the environment. More than 75 percent of the feed in the United States is manufactured by AFI members. AFI members also manufacture approximately 70 percent of the country's non-grain ingredients, including soybean meal, distillers co-products, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, yeast products, and other miscellaneous and special ingredients, of which there are 900 approved by the Food and Drug Administration to use in animal feed. A recent economic report funded by AFI's foundation, the Institute for Feed Education and Research, found that our industry provides nearly one million jobs and nearly $300 billion in sales with 6,000 feed mills and just over 500 pet food manufacturing facilities. The sales amount includes pet food, which represents less than half of this sales number. So about $170 billion in feed sales across the United States. We appreciate the opportunity to comment on these important issues for our members. Our members are engaged in the animal agriculture sector and support NIFA investment in commercial animal agriculture research, extension, and education. Animal agriculture products provide a strong foundation of nutrition in the American food supply and is an industry that relies heavily on science and innovation to produce more food more sustainably and more efficiently. AFI's top priority for NIFA is to invest in research extension and education which will help improve the sustainability and efficiency of commercial animal agriculture on a parity with plant agriculture. A specific area where NIFA can support is the training and development of qualified agriculture workforce through investment in education. It's been observed by our members that there is a lack of qualified candidates to fill positions in our industry. And thus AFI suggests more emphasis by NIFA on developing animal agriculture education. With the growing advancements in science and technology, there is an observed knowledge and communication gap between the basic sciences and the application in animal agriculture. There is an obvious need for NIFA to increase funding for extension programs in animal agriculture to shrink this gap. We are aware that USDA and FDA received an appropriation from Congress to educate the public on biotechnology. We urge researchers and the public to view the new film, Food, Food Evolution, to see one way of educating the public on new technologies. I think this is available both in Netflix and on Amazon. With recent changes in regulation of antibiotic use in animal feed and the continued demand of the consumer for reduction in the use of antibiotics by the Food and Drug Administration, there is a strong need for research alternatives to antibiotic use. There are limited options due to consumer demand of animal products without antibiotics, creating a need for alternative uh, production, animal well-being, and food safety. And we urge NIFA to fund you, uh, work in uh, alternatives to antibiotics. Thank you for the opportunity to make these brief comments, and we wish you success, and we'll continue to support agriculture appropriations. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Sellers? Great. It's so nice to hear someone with a, that accent that Dr. Broussard has. You guys are, it's. <laughs> It's, it's wonderful. I love hearing it. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Warren Courtney from Venka Robotics. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Warren Courtney. I'm with Vecna Robotics. Um, our company is founded in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we're led by a man named Daniel Theobald. Um, as I've come to work for the company, uh, it's a, it was a complete change for me to come from my previous background of leadership in retail to over to robotics and working with Daniel. And if you ever get a chance to spend a few minutes with him, he's always thinking about the next solution, the next 
um, opportunity to solve problems. Um, he's been quoted in uh, Boston Scientific that we are trying to be partners in the innovation process um, and working with him it's really a world view. He's trying to solve world issues. The theme for the company is better technology, better world. And it's truly a privilege to work with Daniel and with this group. Did the slides go? I saw it up there. This concept that Daniel brings forward is called twisted fields. <coughs> Excuse me. Vecna Robotics believes the most promising scientific opportunities for the advancement of food and agricultural sciences involves incorporating robots and autonomous platforms into the agricultural industry. We seek to bring our mature robotics and autonomy technology to the area of precision farming and agricultural technology. With extensive experience in the areas of automation, machine vision, and human robotic interactions, Vecna's technology can readily be adapted to the agricultural application and provide immediate benefits to the industry. The agricultural market is faced with several challenges. Lower yields yield over year over year. Um, there's becoming a strain on the food supply and the U.S. farmer is experiencing a 45% drop in net farm income since 2013. Um, labor shortages are increasing um, along with prices, prices increasing. Um, but one of the primary things that we'd like to produce or excuse me, that we would like to address is there are millions lost in crop rot and we want to increase productivity of yieldable uh, produce from the agriculture industry. We believe there's an incredible opportunity with automation. We seek to disrupt the large equipment cycle uh, for the farmer. The transition that was made throughout history when the farmer started using tractors and heavy equipment was really revolutionary to the industry. And we're seeking to produce that same type of yield improvement to the industry through this automation process. There'll be a less reliance on labor. Uh, we also look to minimize the use of chemicals through precision farming. Uh, we want to unlock the yield potential for the, for the farms. We're focusing on um, automating redundancies in the processes. Um, precision spraying, harvesting, and seeding will help make those improvements in the industry. So our model that we're bringing forward is the pre Precision Farming Rover. Um, it provides localization, navigation, power management, communications. Um, this unit is autonomous and it's also solar powered um, and it's low cost which will make it affordable to each farmer that needs one. It can do a multitude of different things from soil sampling, weeding, harvesting, harvesting. Um, I'm not, not sure if you're familiar with BRICS testing but we're doing some work with Bricks testing and harvesting to help reduce um, the amount of lost crops that are ready for harvesting. So the strategy is to disrupt the agriculture equipment industry by offering a robust and proven autonomy system at a cost that makes aut automation affordable for every farmer. We want to make this also solar powered, which will reduce the farmer's dependency on energy and allowing farmers to trade carbon credits. Um, and we want to make this easy to make this a worldwide application 
so that everyone can access this. We have a diverse team of people that are working on this. Uh, they come from all backgrounds, across all industries, and not just anyone can work at Vecna. We have a lot of people with some very, very stacked resumes that um, weren't able to move and provide things as quickly as possible. So um, it's truly a unique blend. Um, we have a location in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as stated earlier, but we also have a 127 acre farm that we're working with in San Gregorio, California. Uh, we're looking to provide a low risk, excuse me, low risk, high reward for the farmers that are there. Um, and the opportunities are endless. Um, through precision, fertilization, planting, and spraying, we really hope to revolutionize the industry. Um, by the year 2024, it is projected that robotics will be at a $5.7 billion level in the agricultural industry. VECNA has submitted proposals and been awarded funding for grants addressing the USDA's research priorities, specifically improving crop production methods or strategy, crop, pro excuse me, crop protection against antibiotic and biotic stress, and energy conservation. VECNA's prime goal is to create technology that is affordable to both purchase and maintain and easy to use and support. We seek to address environmental and climate concerns that impact food safety, labor shortages, and maximize crop yields. Um, again, Vecna looks to be the perfect partner for innovation, and we truly are a company striving, striving for better technology, a better world, and better agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? All right, why don't you come back up here? And can you please introduce yourself? Yes, I'm John Brabancor from Michigan State University and also from the IEEE. Uh, my question is about your uh, platform. Is your, uh, so you, you essentially need a pretty high compute performance to do some of these functions like machine vision. Does that live on the platform itself? Does it go to the cloud? What networking do you use to connect those? So we're, we're working primarily in warehouses right now with the platform, and we're transferring that technology over to agriculture. Um, I believe it's on the cloud, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, next up is Dr. Michael O'Neill from the Northeast Extension Directors. Thank you. Good morning, folks. I guess if Merle Broussard joined the uh, NIFA in the Lincoln administration, I must have joined in the Truman administration. It was a long time ago. Still see some familiar faces, but there's a lot of new folks there at NIFA as well. So um, just full disclosure, I used to work at NIFA, so I uh, have mixed feelings about when we offer comments to them how direct they should be. Because um, I used to have to answer those comments. I'm here on behalf of the Northeast Extension Directors. Um, we represent land-grant universities from Maine to Maryland, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia, 12 states and the district. We have some of the largest uh, land-grant universities in that system, but we also have many of the smallest land-grant universities in that system. And in the Northeast, we also have partners at historically black land-grant universities, West Virginia State, Delaware State, and the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Um, so I have five points that I want to make this morning, so we're going to keep rolling faster, even though I know my friends would say, if you put O'Neill on the stage, you won't get him down for a long time. I'm not going to do that today. Uh, the Northeast Extension Directors support the concept of addressing sustainable food systems. And it was really, it's felt like a really great setup to have the folks that came before me talk about the things that they're interested in because it is very much um, complementary to what we're interested in. 
We want to ensure that the unique characteristics of agricultural systems of the Northeast are well represented in NIFA's approach. Um, the Northeast is home to over 60 million consumers, representing a substantial proportion of food consumption. And funding opportunities for us, we believe that funding opportunities that promote sustainable practices for consumers, not just producers, are essential in solving all of our food problems. We're committed to, produce, to promoting agricultural liter literacy for consumers across rural, suburban, and urban settings. And we believe that there is a need for integrated programs and projects where research, education, and extension are used to develop and implement innovative approaches to promote sustainable consumer behavior. So we want you to focus on some consumer behavior, not just producer behavior. Um, secondly, there's a great diversity of agriculture in the Northeast that involve food and non-food systems. And the Northeast Extension Directors encourage NIFA to make available grants that support all of these diverse agricultural activities, including small and large systems. In the Northeast, high-tech, climate-controlled agriculture represents a major opportunity to exp expand food production, particularly in urban and some exurban um, environments. These production systems are unique, and we enc encourage you to, in to include opportunities to conduct integrated work in these environments, um, not just field-based agriculture. The most recent agricultural census revealed a growth in the number of farms and, farm and, the, and the number of farmers in New England. Much of this growth is occurring in small acreage organic agriculture. Interestingly, and I think you know, it couldn't have been a better setup, but the technologies that have been developed for agriculture mostly have been developed for large commercial agricultural systems, and often these are not scalable for use by small farms, particularly the, sm the small farms in New England where income may be $25,000 or less. So we request that NIFA support applied research to improve sustainable small farms in the Northeast. And we see this as also expanding the role of NIFA in meeting the global food supply because many um, international developing nations are really dealing with small acreage landowners and their role in agriculture. And we believe that what we're doing across the Northeast has particular um, value in supporting development of sustainable agriculture around the globe. Thirdly, uh, we see that there's very little competitive funding that exists for single function extension activities to create real impacts on the landscape. And so we would just encourage NIFA to um, increase the funding available for extension-led projects that lead to measurable outcomes in appropriate integrated programs. And, and I think appropriate is the key there that not every program is going to be focused just on extension, but we see lots of uh, single function research activities available, not as many single function extension programs available. Uh, fourth, we support the use of evaluation expertise to measure outcomes of funded projects for very large projects, and you know, NIFA has funded many in the $5 million and, and larger range. It's appropriate to require external evaluation, but on smaller projects, we would recommend that internal evaluation be sufficient, and that's particularly um, important for small institutions where we have less capacity to be able to do that external um, evaluation and where the cost is considerably higher than what they can typically afford. And lastly, uh, this is my last point, I am compelled by my colleagues, and so I just want to make that clear to NIFA, uh, to point out that the Northeast region extends far beyond the District of Columbia and the Beltway. Please consider your future meetings in many of our wonderful destinations to the north of here, which might include places like Wilmington, Philadelphia, Atlantic City, New York City, Hartford, or Boston. The Northeast is a big region. Please come visit us. We could use your economic support. So thank you very much for the time to talk to you. Any questions? All right, quiet group this morning. We'll just keep rolling along. Next up is Ed Jones from the Virginia Extension Service, and he will uh, talk to you right now. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. It's always dangerous to follow Mike O'Neill. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate in this session of NIFA Listens and 
To let you know, I'm Ed Jones. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Virginia Tech, and I'm Director of Virginia Cooperative Extension. And Virginia Cooperative Extension is a strong and established partnership of Virginia Tech and Virginia State Universities. I spent my uh, entire professional career, which spans over 30 years in Extension. I started as an Extension Wildlife Specialist at Mississippi State University, then to North Carolina State University, and now at Virginia Tech. It's been my privilege to serve Extension in a number of leadership roles regionally and nationally over the years. As examples, I served as the founding chair of the National 4-H Wildlife Habitat Evaluation Program, president of the National, Associate, National, Community Development, National Association of Community Development Extension Professionals. You can beat me up later, Stacy. And I've also served as chair of the Extension Disaster Education Network. I currently serve on the executive committee of ECOP, the Extension Committee on Organization and Policy, which is the representative body of the cooperative extension system, or section of APLU. And I also co-chair the ECOP 4-H Leadership Committee. The ECOP 4-H Leadership Committee was created in 2014, and it provides policy guidance for 4-H nationally and is a partnership of the extension system, NIFA, and National 4-H Council. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of ECOP. And I'm glad to see Dr. Qureshi has on his 4-H tie today, so we appreciate that. As I approach the questions posed, I would first like to say that ECOP, in seeking to develop a strategic direction for ECOP for the coming years, went through an inclusive process to determine the programmatic priorities for the system. These priorities are nutrition, health and wellness, positive youth development, water quality and quantity, food production and food security, and community development. In response to the first question, an overarching priority is that of a balanced portfolio of capacity and competitive funding provided by our federal partner. This is an important issue for extension and research. Extension and research at Virginia Tech work in very close partnership, and we often say that it is impossible to say where one ends and the other begins. In that integrated context, capacity funding provides the ongoing infrastructure to support programs and initiatives, and competitive funding provides opportunities to focus for a limited time on a specific question or issue. Capacity funding is the foundation upon which extension can be responsive, flexible, and innovative. I encourage my colleagues at Virginia Tech to take risks and to try new approaches new methods, or new program topics, knowing full well that some of these will not be productive, but others may produce profound and unexpected results. Being accountable in a programmatic or project sense could stifle such creativity and limit innovation that is desperately needed. Other examples of the importance of capacity funds can be seen in disaster response and recovery and in positive youth development. In the South, hurricanes are an all too often occurrence. Extension faculty and staff at all levels must have the ability to immediately change their programs and activities to address the pressing needs of their communities and clientele. Immediate action is, of course, critical, but just as important is the long-term recovery process. Extension is still in the community long after other state and federal agencies and non-government organizations have moved on. I've seen this importance firsthand. While in North Carolina, I directed the six-month-long animal mortality disposal program following Hurricane Floyd in 1999. I also had the privilege of managing the state-funded disaster assistance enrollment program for housing and agricultural assistance followed by subsequent hurricanes. The presence and commitment of extension in those impacted communities can often be the key to a faster and more successful recovery. Capacity funding is also critical in supporting positive youth development. Positive youth development is a long-term proposition. The ECOP 4-H Leadership Committee has adopted the goal of growing 4-H from 6 million participants enrolled to 10 million by 2025. 
To do so will require creative and new ways of reaching youth who have not had access in the past in a manner that is attractive and inviting to youth of various cultures and backgrounds and provide the opportunities for growth for those youth that are not available by any other means. This growth and participation is critical to providing the productive, responsible, and civically engaged individuals needed to lead us into the future. The future of agriculture and our communities depend upon a productive workforce, be they scientists, producers, entrepreneurs, or educators. To achieve these ends, stability in youth programming is critical, and that stability is ensured through capacity funds. Adequate capacity funding is critical for the success and stability of all our land-grant institutions to meet the extension and research needs of the future. In response to the second question, I offer two topics of importance and opportunity. The first is big data. As the issues we address in extension become increasingly complex, it requires new approaches on how to focus and be impactful and relevant. The science behind data development, management, analysis, and interpretation are critical to making quality de decisions to be sure we are meeting the most pressing needs of our communities. As an example, the Social De Decision Analytics Lab in the Virginia Tech Bioinformatics Institute and Virginia Cooperative Extension are partnering with Iowa State University in the development of a community learning data-driven discovery process. This process commences with a data discovery workshop by asking local leaders what questions they have but cannot, cannot currently answer. The process continues with identifying data sources that can provide insights, wrangling the data, using statistical and geospatial learning along with the community's collective knowledge to inform policy decisions, and then developing, deploying, and evaluating intervention strategies based on scientifically based principles. The expectation is that Extension and other agencies and organizations can focus in on the most pressing needs and develop solutions. This project has led to a larger conversation of the regional rural development centers and extension faculty across the country on the use of data in new and innovative ways not previously conceivable. I also want to return to positive youth development and 4-H. In order to meet the challenge of growing leaders for the future, significant investment and attention are needed to understand youth development in the digital age and to evaluate and develop methodologies for attracting and retaining youth from various cultures into positive youth development programs. The development of evaluation and impact assessment tools are important to continual improvement of, private, of positive youth development approaches, and there are significant research and extension opportunities should resources be available that would result in a more impactful approach to growing future leaders. So again, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to participate this morning and speak to you on behalf of ECOP. We look forward to our continued and productive relationship between the Cooperative Extension System and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? We have another minute. All right. Next up, we have Robert Taylor Jr. from West Virginia University, the Division of Animal and Nutritional Sciences. Good morning. At the, at the break, Dr. Broussard, Mr. Sellers, and I will hold an accent competition to which you're all invited. Thank you for the opportunity to present at this NIFA listening session. I speak on behalf of many scientists whose research efforts rely on defined genetic stocks that encompass highly inbred, random bred from many years past, long-term selected or single gene mutants in poultry and livestock. Their research results benefit producers and consumers while contributing to broad science knowledge. 
Genetic impacts on disease resistance were elucidated using such stocks, providing a basic research foundation for improved animal health. My research outputs over 39 years would have been very different without those resources. In 1999, the Avian Genetic Resources Task Force highlighted the critical status of many genetic stocks. The USDA initiated the National Animal Germplasm Program to conserve resources primarily through cryopreservation, a method which functions quite well for multiple species but is less adequate for poultry. The program also developed national, national recognition for designated elite genetic stocks following nomination, committee vetting, and approval. Resources I developed over 23 years to examine genetics of disease resistance were recognized in 2005 but were eliminated in 2007 to meet budget constraints. The national recognition offered little beyond moral support. Within the last decade, stocks have been eliminated by the USDA ADOL, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, UC Davis, Iowa State University, and others. Multiple commentaries in prestigious journals, including Science, Nature, and Poultry Science, describe the critical nature of genetic resources and their plight. Appeals to NIFA, as well as the USDA, generated little enthusiasm and less understanding for the dire state of these valuable assets. Available resources continue to decline via eradications that often leave no time for disbursement to alternate sites. Loss of biodiversity impacts food security in the face of predicted human population increases. The research community is near having genome sequences on a flash drive but no live animal resources. A funding mechanism for special collections of unique poultry and livestock is needed, particularly in light of continued resource loss and the advancing age of many curators. One concept would be a central facility that handles agricultural species, similar to the Jackson Lab for mice. Another option is grant support beyond capacity funds for special stocks at their current home institution. The Livestock Conservancy seeks to protect endangered livestock and poultry breeds from extinction. That organization and others can contribute to the overall solution. The blueprint for USDA efforts in agricultural animal genomics 2018 to 2027 under current development should prioritize resource preservation. Let's work together to move genetic resources beyond the well-known weather description, everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. I have several additional bullet points which may merit elaboration outside of today's proceedings. First, NIFA should develop a can-do attitude that seeks solutions. Second, colleagues of mine report difficulty in accessing sequences, chips, databases from particular sources. Broad use of such important resources benefits all of agriculture rather than individual stakeholders in the spirit of USDA's overall mission. Resources developed with public funds should be available to the entire research community without 
complication, and NIFA needs to press on this point. Third, there should be greater communication among NIFA staff members. A different colleague of mine was encouraged by a NIFA staff to submit a proposal, highly relevant, to a program for emergency funding on pressing issues. The submission arrived, underwent internal review by a person under, unaware of the prior encouragement, and was subsequently classified as not relevant. At a minimum, such situations challenge perception and create a credibility gap. Next, avian influenza and salmonella were excluded from a recent stakeholder survey highlighting important animal diseases. Were these omitted because of their relationship to human health and food safety? No matter the reason, such items should have been listed in both areas as avian influenza and salmonella impact health in both animals and humans. Finally, NIFA liaisons need higher emphasis on their interactions with multi-state committees, academic scientists, and other stakeholders. Such groups represent a neglected source of grassroots information about research needs. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I'll field any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so Thank much. You. You All right. Is Janice Wills here? Okay. That brings us to our lunch break, but I am wondering, or our morning break, <laughs> and we are way ahead of schedule. So I'm wondering if Eugenia would be willing to come up. Wonderful. Eugenia Gusev is from the International Rescue Committee. Thank you. Okay. Let me make sure I figure out the slide. Okay. So, thank you for the introduction and for your time today. I work with the IRC and I'm based here locally in Silver Spring. Um, the IRC is an international organization, but in the U.S. we work with refugee resettlement, um, but we also have a lot of programs that focus on food security and agriculture. We also work abroad in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East in humanitarian aid and development settings, where we also have a lot of um, agricultural and food uh, type programs. In the United States, we have about 13 offices that focus on this type of programming. And broadly speaking, these are our areas of focus. So we have farms and gardens, food security and nutrition. We focus a lot on underserved populations. We have uh, farmers markets, and we also work a lot with uh, youth and women um, around food justice programs. So just to give you um, a little bit of insight in terms of our latest impact. Um, in the last calendar year, we served about almost 5,000 clients across the United States. We generated, um, through our farming activities, about $98,000 $98, um, in income. Um, and then we have, as I said, 13 different locations across the United States where we do farming and food security work. Um, we also, in the way that we approach food and farming programs, um, we focus on the individual, but we do a lot of systems work. Um, a lot of our programs are uh, faced at working um, with the community, uh, designing our programs with the community, and really looking at local need. Uh, we are CFP and FINI grantees. Um, they have been, the sources of funding have been incredibly beneficial to expanding our food security and nutrition and agricultural programs. So we are very thankful to, the, to NIFA and to USDA for their support. So in terms of areas of interest, um, I spoke with my team and just having had experience uh, with IRC, um, 
over seven years now, um, have, have some idea in terms of where we would love to see more investment and what's working um, and what would help support the communities that we're working with. So we're seeing a lot of opportunity to invest in, um, in testing and developing ethnic crops um, and testing them across the United States in different regions. Um, many of these crops are only consumed by, currently are not very well known. They have incredible nutritional benefits um, I think, you know, if, if we've seen um, in supermarkets in the last 10 years the rise of um, ethnic crops like quinoa and um, certain types of uh, goji berries, things that, you know, nobody has ever heard of 10 years ago, but now they're, they become really popular. So there's a lot of these crops that are there and are difficult to find for the communities that we're working with. Um, we are working with farmers who know how to farm um, this produce and we know that it's, it's, it's growing very well in certain climate zones. So we'd love to see a little bit more investment in, in researching how well um, these crops can be adapted, marketed, and consumed, um, and also kind of looking at the nutritional benefits across the board. Another area is um, evaluating, um, looking at food access specifically, evaluating the impact of nutrition incentives to other populations beyond beyond SNAP eligible clients and also widening the type of food allowed under these programs to WIC and SSI recipients. So we also have had, before we had Finney, we, we had a similar type of, um, uh, we call it the fresh fund, so dollar for dollar match on our farmers markets on, on fresh produce, we call it the fresh fund. Um, and it was supported by uh, private, private funding at the time. It still is, we have, we have this funding in parallel with Finney. Um, and we, at the time, did not restrict it to SNAP. So we know that there's a, a great need for this, um, that the redemption rate is very high when we do have ability to give out WIC and SSI uh, dollar for dollar incentives. Um, and then widening to other produce, produce local produce, um, like meats and cheese and healthy carbs and eggs, again, to support local production, but also to give people a little bit more choice in a more balanced diet. Um, I know that nutrition incentives are meant to be a supplement to SNAP, um, but we also know that a lot of the, of the communities that we work with still struggle to live on SNAP amounts. So restricting their diet um, to fresh fruits and veggies uh, with this incentive program um, that currently it, it, you know, is, is ongoing, um, it would be interesting to just look at the impact of widening the scope of that um, to, to kind of create a little bit more choice for the people that we're working with. Um, I would also, just because I come from an international programs background, would love for, for us to look at and, and model and maybe test some international approaches to, to these types of incentive programs. Um, if, you, if you Google cash programs, there's quite a bit of evidence that's coming out around restricted and unrestricted cash programs. Um, so I think that there's a lot of things that we can potentially learn from that, that are happening abroad. Um, so it would, be, it would be great to, to create opportunity to test uh, models from abroad here in the United States context. Around food education um, research, one of the areas of my focus is working with community health promoters um, to help uh, to do outreach um, in, uh, in disadvantaged communities and ethnic communities around nutrition education, management of diet-related diseases. And, um, as of late, we've been making a lot of connection between our community health promoters and our farming and our market programs and our incentive programs. So we see that there, this type of model, which is evidence-based um, in certain areas, um, is very malleable and works really well hand-in-hand -hand with nutrition incentive programs. Um, so we would love a little bit more investment and research as well in this type of behavioral change um, education using community health promoters um, as Currently, the evidence base, is, as I've seen it, is um, very, very specific along HIV, AIDS management, um, diabetes, but not so much around kind of broader issues um, that touch nutrition, and especially for ethnic, ethnic communities in the United States. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity to do research, to build more in an evidence base there. It's a very flexible and cost-effective model, um, but as I, as I said, it, it would be great to see a little bit more investment, to see um, how it works and what types of behavioral change education work better in the home or maybe at the farmer's market at a more kind of wider scale in, in the community. So there's a lot of iterations there that can be tested and it's always difficult to find funding that will fund the operational aspect of the program and also the research element in such a way that it's impactful. 
Um, around food research, we would love to see some investment through building an evidence base on cost effectiveness and impact of food incentives uh, on very specific health issues affecting communities. So for example, through my work, I can see that our minority populations, we see um, a lot of our clients are coming with iron, calcium, and B12 deficiencies. Um, so addressing specific health concerns which are found in underserved immigrant refugee communities through healthy food access farming and urban gardening and studying the short and long-term impact in addressing these public health concerns, doing some comparative cost studies would be really impactful for our populations and the wider community. And as I said again, you know, we got the operational end, but getting enough funding to really have an impactful large scale study and it would be you know we're we're not health practitioners um, we would have to partner up with a medical institution and to get access to that level of data and to have enumerators all of these costs are you know they they add up <laughs> so getting enough funding to be able to run this type of intervention plus the research would be would be really impactful um, and then a cross-cutting theme, which I think you've already gleaned from, from my presentation, is evaluating equal access and equity along racial and ethnic minor, um, lines for food access interventions to ensure access to point of sales and SNAP incentives across the board. So I'm thinking, um, or we're thinking that there's really a need for a human-centered design, that there's a real opportunity to do that, to test through the cultural, the geographic, and attitudinal barriers lens to see how incentives are reaching um, these disadvantaged communities. So I will end with that. Um, just in conclusion, you know, while my topic's focused very much on minority populations, we, we do feel that the impact would be far greater and impactful on a mar much larger scale. And we are very grateful to the continued support of NIFA and USDA for our programs and their investment in a scientific approach to solving complex public health and agricultural related issues. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Are there any questions for Eugenia? Okay. So I would like to know if Marcia DeLong is willing to go a little bit ahead of schedule. And she has a PowerPoint as well. Thank you. Good morning still. Um, first of all, so I'm Marcia Delange. I am a senior scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is a science-based nonprofit advocacy organization um, just here in, in DC. So first I wanted to thank NIFA uh, for also providing this opportunity, this tremendous opportunity to um, provide some comments on priorities and science directions for food and agriculture. And I am here today um, to really talk about the promise of agroecology. So thinking about an ecological system science approach that really looks to support farmer livelihoods while also achieving environmental and social benefits um, to really advance the fields of food and agricultural science um, and make the case that this could be a really uh, valuable area for NIFA to continue to invest more in. And I, uh, I so <laughs> um, the need to prioritize the agroecology in the public research, in, within public research funding is something that Union of Concerned Scientists has been working on for quite some time now um, in response to hearing a lot from colleague scientists around the United States that this was an area of um, great promise, but one that, received, that had very limited funding going into it. Um, we actually crafted this sign-on statement that articulated some of these concerns that were coming from uh, scientists. And uh, today, nearly 500 experts and counting have signed this statement. So we think that this is a really uh, important document that shows that scientists across the country really do um, have a demand for more resources to do this kind of important research. And given this widespread sentiment that more public funds might be needed for this kind of research uh, to fill these important gaps in knowledge, um, we wanted to better understand what 
uh, the current landscape, the current state of funding within uh, U.S. public funding sources actually looked like. So uh, this is just a snapshot from a study that many of you might be familiar with that we did a couple of years ago, um, actually digging in a little bit and looking at NIFA funds, um, public funds for uh, re agricultural research overall and looking to identify different kind of components of, of research with across research programs and really seeking um, where agroecology practices and ideas were showing up. Um, and the bottom line of this research was that um, relative to kind of some of the other areas of research that are very important, like uh, increasing efficiency and working towards substituting in new practices for practices that have, have become more um, understood to be more uh, damaging or concerning. Uh, agroecological practices which really think about redesigning systems and then the social uh, research that looks towards how would we scale these practices up um, is a little bit more limited. So to build on this growing understanding of the landscape for public funds for agroecological research, we also we developed this um, survey, which we conducted last April, and it was really meant to ask the scientists to um, articulate even further what they felt were the opportunities, obstacles, and needs surrounding public support for agroecology. Um, the questions for this survey were peer-reviewed and IRB approved, um, and there were 28 questions. And we released this survey um, very broadly to have make sure that anybody who was interested in responding would have an opportunity. Um, and so this survey is newly available on the UCS website at www.ucsusa.org slash agroecology survey. We did get 176 qualified respondents, and by qualified, all I mean is that uh, these were people who had masters or PhDs uh, within uh, sustainable agriculture related fields and, um, and continue to work in this profession. Um, and I wanted just to point out quickly that they did represent a wide range of regions as well as career tracks as well as um, experience in the field. So people have been working uh, in the field for less than 10 years or, or more than 10 years um, were all part of this survey. And I wanted to today just highlight a few of the top priorities for research that really emerged in analyzing the responses that, that came from this survey. And the, the first one is just this, this need to um, have grants available at a wide range of scales. So this was mentioned earlier today, um, that really critically we need smaller grants for high risk and pilot projects, but we also need to be thinking about longer grants for more complex projects, especially uh, when you think about agroecology and the system science and the complex systems that that field is oftentimes looking at, uh, recognizing that longer grants are, are really important. A second theme that emerged from these survey findings is that there's very much a demand, a growing demand, I think, for interdisciplinary systems level research and particularly research that emphasizes economics, human health, and equity issues. So racial equity, gender equity, and, and really across the board. Um, these kind of uh, topics are very central to the missions, of course, of 1890, 1994, and 2004 university institutions. Um, but of course, they could be better, better integrated throughout land-grant universities. And the third theme is that Scientists really express that they have a demand for additional training and encouragement that could help them communicate better, uh, communicate to a wide range of stakeholders, uh, including farmers, of course, there's a lot of that, but also the general public and policymakers. And so maybe there's a role for NIFA to play in strengthening programs that really help scientists have these skills. In terms of the most promising opportunities for uh, the science in food and agriculture, uh, we are finding and we believe that continuous living cover practices, so practices like um, cover cropping and, and perennials and agroforestry, 
Um, so working lands, on working lands, is a very promising opportunity even within the umbrella of agroecological research. And that this uh, research and looking at these practices from the perspective of uh, research and development targeted towards supporting farmers and promoting diverse jobs, reducing erosion, mitigating droughts and floods, increasing resilience, thinking about the food energy water nexus, system science, and, and again, um, how can these kinds of systems be developed to address inequities um, really offer some of the most promising opportunities. And I just wanted to say that this is work that uh, these are ideas um, and promising areas of research that are supported through a growing body of work that we've been involved with, but we're also seeing it coming out of the peer-reviewed literature from uh, land-grant universities and other institutions uh, across the country. And so I want to end there, and I just want to thank NIFA again for the important role that you play uh, in um, supporting public food and agriculture research, of course, and again for the opportunity today to share some ideas. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Do y'all have one more in yet before our morning break? All right. Is Gina Luke here? Wonderful. Thanks for being so flexible. And we will just move our break up a little bit. Um, it's about 9.50 now, so we will break from 10 to 10.20. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning and uh, participate in this NIFA Stakeholder Forum to highlight food and ag and, re and research education extension priorities. I'm Gina Luke. I'm an assistant director in the AVMA's Governmental Relations Division and uh, our association represents about 90,000 veterinarians practicing across the United States. The AVMA strongly advocates for research to improve animal health and welfare, and ultimately uh, that impacts human health. We strongly support uh, the National Institute for Food and Agriculture and its entire array of programs impacting animal health. And understanding how changes in management practices that impact herd or flock health is essential for future advancements in food animal agriculture. A top priority for NIFA must be developing data-driven models of how changes in management practices influence animal health and welfare, environmental health, and ultimately human health. Specific examples to accomplish this include innovations that allow monitoring of antibiotic resistance in field situations, and how changes in management practices influence key indicators of animal health and our welfare. Similarly, efficient food production as well as animal or individual animals is optimized by good animal health. Management practices to promote animal health must be investigated with a special emphasis on the effect of nutrition, on prevention of disease, correction of physiological imbalances, and efficient energy utilization. Research into other management practices include sanitation and hygiene conditions that may lead to a reduction in the exposure of humans to animal pathogens. The AVMA urges NIFA to nurture and prioritize training of today's and tomorrow's scientists to be valuable resources in control, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of environmentally associated diseases in people and animals. The, o the agency is encouraged to continue partnering with other federal agencies to support interdisciplinary research. We believe it is essential for NIFA to bolster training opportunities for pre- and postdoctoral students to engage with and focus on animal health and research in the natural and altered ecosystems of our cities, our farms, and wild areas, as well as agriculture and biomedical research we urge the continued support of um, advances in minor use animal drugs uh, for uh, the use of, of drugs um, in a minor way with major species and for those who, uh, minor species that don't have drugs, we would urge NIFA uh, to engage in that process in the development of those opportunities. 
Um, we believe this will foster scientific partnerships that lead to real solutions in solving environmental, food safety, and trade issues, as well as re-emerging and new emerging diseases that affect our world. On a side note, we encourage NIFA to continue its investment in programs that make sure that veterinary services are available in rural and underserved areas of our country, namely through the Veterinary Medicine Loan Repayment Program and the Veterinary Services Grant Program. Uh, one of those, the Loan Repayment Program, has helped make sure that veterinary services are available in rural areas and in underserved areas of the veterinary profession. Uh, there's been over 388 awards since 2010. And we uh, just saw the second cycle of awards for the Veterinary Services Grant awarded in September, and so we applaud NIFA uh, for those two particular programs. The AVMA believes that recruiting and training scientists who are uniquely qualified to engage in in vivo studies will help meet current and future health needs related to both a healthy food supply as well as the control of zoonotic diseases. It is critical that NIFA increase its investment in livestock poultry, and aquaculture. Control of endemic and zoonotic animal diseases ought to be a top research priority for our federal, our state, and local governments, and our land-grant colleges. This includes the development of new diagnostic assays for the earlier recognition of pathogens, as well as the development of new vaccine strategies to control the transmission of pathogens from animal to animal and animals to humans. We urge NIFA to continue its investment in the tactical sciences, and we applaud your efforts in that area. Uh, we specifically want to draw attention to the Food Animal Residue Avoidance Data Bank, the National Animal Health Laboratory Network, again, the Minor Use Animal Drug Program, the Food Ag Defense Initiative, and the Animal Health Disease Research Program. Research is needed to better define the mechanisms by which microbes can change, mutate, or adapt to host species or become resistant to existing antibiotics. Emerging infectious agents must be characterized and their interactions with the host and the environment defined. Research efforts should explore the possibilities that new biotechnologies provide uh, for the development of novel and improved diagnostic tests to identify infected animals and new vaccines to protect both animals and humans against clinical disease and prevent transmission of diseases. NIFA must be at the scientific forefront of rapid identification and eventual control of new and emerging diseases which require surveillance and monitoring of diseases patterns in humans and in animals. We urge NIFA to emphasize development of new antimicrobial agents as well as the development of alternative strategies for treating and preventing infectious disease. Finally, NIFA's support for research that advances the development of objective and evidence-based criteria for the assessment of animal welfare for all species is important. NIFA is encouraged to foster research to enhance understanding of animal welfare. The health and welfare of animals under human, con human care is an important and increasing societal concern. Veterinarians play an essential role in determining the standards of care and protecting the well-being of animals used as companions for production of food and fiber in biomedical research, for work in an exhibition, as well as entertainment, and again, uh, for those in shelters and sanctuaries. We want to associate, associate ourselves with the comments of the next um, person who you'll hear, uh, I believe, after the break, Ted Mishima, Dr. Ted Mishima from the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges. We stand in solidarity with the AAVMC and uh, we thank NIFA for this opportunity. Take any questions you might have. Any questions? So it seems like this prominent microphone is not encouraging for people to make questions. Dr. Koresh? <laughs> Stay up here. Can you use the mic so folks online can hear? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. In our previous listening sessions across the country, we heard a lot about uh, transboundary diseases. Can you expand on that? What is AVMA's position or guidance? 
guidance to us on transboundary businesses? Um, well, what I would say is the ABMA, uh, along with our other stakeholder partners, would really prefer to have um, much more scientific uh, focus on the ability to ensure that we are addressing diseases that go from um, uh, people to animals, animals to people, from animals to animals. So um, outside of, of that, I, I really, can I defer to Dr. Mishima or perhaps Dr. Stump in the audience? You want to come up, Lauren? Uh, Lauren Stump, also at ABMA and Government Relations Division. Um, to your question, I don't know that ABMA has a, you know, stance necessarily formulated on transboundary diseases. We are certainly interested in looking at, um, in having research and looking at diseases, as Gina said, that are zoonotic um, or a transfer between animals, regardless of where those pathogens arise or where those diseases are, you know, we're certainly concerned. Uh, with zoonotic diseases, uh, with diseases that are vector-borne, um, and with the One Health concept and, and human and animal health. So transboundary diseases would be one of those components that AVMA would be interested in seeing further research and attention applied to in the greater context of disease research, um, animal health and welfare, human health and welfare as well. Any others? All right, thank you.